Israeli army tanks move towards the center of Khan Yunis city after a night of artillery shelling around Gaza. Zelensky tells G7 leaders that Russia is hoping Western support for Ukraine will collapse in the next year. As the planet warms up, scientists worry about tipping points, which they say could cause a mini ice age in Europe. Palestinian children pulling their belongings from the rubble in the devastated city of Khan Yunus, just eight kilometers from Gaza's border crossing with Egypt. Israeli forces continue to carpet bomb the besieged enclave. They claim they are fighting Hamas fighters and senior officials. <laughs> Gaza's health ministry says more than 16,200 Palestinians, mostly women and children, have been killed in Israeli bombardments. The Kamal Adwan hospital, the last one serving the north, has stopped operating due to lack of fuel. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights says Palestinians are living in utter terror. The IDF says it has struck approximately 250 targets in the Gaza Strip over the past 24 hours. Israel has vowed to destroy Hamas and free the 138 hostages still held. As the IDF expands its operations to dismantle Hamas in Gaza, we have not lost sight, not for one moment, of our critical mission to rescue our hostages, to do everything in our power to bring our hostages home. Meanwhile, Israel's military has released these pictures of what they are claiming to be the largest weapons cache found thus far in their ground offensive. One week ahead of a crucial meeting of European heads of state and government, divisions over the Israel-Hamas conflict are once again coming to the fore. The polarization of views on events in the Middle East is becoming so big that leaders representing the bloc are having to think twice about their words. Earlier this week, members of an audience in front of the EU's foreign affairs chief, Joseph Beret, left the room during an NGO event after he said that Israel was creating carnage in the Gaza Strip. What we are witnessing in Gaza is another carnage. How many victims? We don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, someone estimates it's about 15,000, but uh, I'm afraid that below the rubbles of the houses destroyed, it must be many more with a high number of children. So... Sorry? People are leaving the room. One go on. People are leaving the room? Yes. Why? <laughs> Maybe I said some inconvenience. One conservative MEP from the centre-right EPP group says the beret is biased, following the political agenda of the socialist government in Spain. He adds that the foreign affairs chief is going too far when accusing Israel of massacre. In his opinion, the Jewish state respects international law. We have to wait for the European Council to see what is the position of the different member states and if we can arrive to a common position. That will be the ideal. But in the meantime, there are different opinions. That is what the high representative should reflect, not only one side of the story. Tensions among EU leaders became visible in November when the Belgian and Spanish prime ministers visited the region and both criticized Israel for the suffering of Palestinians. Um. While both Belgium and Spain have a traditionally more pro-Palestinian approach, Germany and Hungary are among the most pro-Israeli countries in the EU. Everyone in the European Union agrees, of course, that um, casu civilian casualties should be avoided uh, in, in Gaza. I mean, this is, this is something that is clearly mentioning uh, among all capitals. However, where we see divisions um, among member states is Israel's right for self-defense. Now, some of the EU member states are taking this argument very seriously and are supporting Israel in this regard, but we see other EU, EU member states that actually try to alleviate uh, this right of self-defense by arguing that there should be proportionality and that the response of Israel is not proportional at all. 
The official EU position on the conflict is to stand in solidarity with Israel and support its rights to self-defense, but in accordance with international humanitarian law. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has told G7 leaders that Russia is ramping up pressures on the front lines and hopes Western support for Kyiv will soon collapse. But I also want to acknowledge their support. Putin plans to simulate re-election for a new presidential term and to quell growing Russian dissatisfaction with the war results. He has significantly increased pressure on the front. Well, Congress, Republicans in Congress are willing to give Putin the greatest gift he could hope for and abandon our global leadership, <clears throat> not just Ukraine, but beyond that. If Putin takes Ukraine, he won't stop there. It's important to see the long run here. He's going to keep going. Any disruption <clears throat> in our ability to supply Ukraine clearly strengthens Putin's position. As Russia intensifies its attacks in Ukraine's east, the White House is asking for another 99 billion euros. But Republicans say they're growing tired of funding war efforts. Braced for the snow and Russian bullets, these Ukrainian soldiers clad in winter camouflage are participating in war games in the northern Chernihiv region. They are learning how to identify and repel enemy saboteurs. І вважаю, що для кожного чоловіка здраво, нормального чоловіка, що якщо він даже там переживає в чому-то боїться, йому стоїть прийти і даже на цих навчаннях відпрацювати це все. Тобто воно закаляє. More than a million Ukrainian and Russian soldiers are currently fighting in eastern Ukraine. In order to combat the freezing temperatures, a Dutch charity has donated purpose-made military kits to help defending troops survive. Average temperatures in Kyiv range from minus 4.8 degrees Celsius to 2 degrees between December and March. While many Ukrainians have returned to liberated pockets of the country, they are now racing against the clock to rebuild their homes before winter really sets in. Our planet is at risk from a series of dangerous tipping points, according to a new scientific report released today. That means the kinds of changes that could happen in just a couple of years and have a massive impact on humanity. I spoke to the report author, Professor Tim Lenton. So our global tipping points report shows that we're already at risk of tipping five damaging uh, Earth system tipping points, the loss of a couple of major ice sheets, uh, disruption of the circulation of the North Atlantic affecting the climate in Europe where we are, um, as well as losing large areas of permafrost that add to global warming and triggering the dieback of coral reefs that half a billion people depend on for their livelihoods. The, the tipping points that may be passed don't just have implications for places like coral reefs or tropical forests. Also, the kinds of changes he's talking about in the Atlantic could have major impacts for Europeans. As a British and European citizen, I'm most concerned about a tipping point in what's called the subpolar gyre of the North Atlantic. The last time this tipped, it gave us the little ice age in Europe. We're not adapted for a sudden shift to a much more seasonal climate that would have much colder, snowier winters, as well as hotter summers, and reduce the growing season for major crops by a couple of months, as well as major disruption to water supplies. A key takeaway is that it's not just every degree of warming that counts, it's every 0.1 degree of warming that counts when it comes to these tipping points, a message the scientists hope will be getting through to delegates here. Jeremy Wilkes at COP28 in Dubai for Euronews. Kilometres of barbed wire dividing what was once an open land border. Similar fences have been erected on the boundaries of Austria, Hungary, Italy and Slovenia amid heightening security concerns over the flow of illegal migrants. 
Meanwhile, Slovenia's former Prime Minister Janis Jansha has called Europeans to, quote, arm themselves, but intellectuals have accused the Conservative politician of xenophobia. Ljubljana has recorded three times the number of illegal border crossings this year compared to last year. In an interview with Euronews Serbia, Jan Shad defended his anti-immigration views and urged Slovenians to take a stand. Uh, actually, this was not statement as a reaction uh, after the uh, war or this uh, terrorist attack in Ukraine. It was a statement addressing the whole situation which are, which you are facing and the current uh, security situation in Slovenia and our abilities to, to defend ourselves as a country. According to Europe's border agency Frontex, this migratory route, which crosses Bosnia, Croatia, Slovenia and Italy, is particularly popular among Syrian and Afghan refugees. Ima to effect na na život ljudi koji su to. Jer kada ti sad zoveš nekoga, tražem stan za prijatelja iz Sirije, a svi sada samo vidu teroristi, 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 taj čovek nema šansa da dobije stan. Italy established controls at its border with Slovenia last October. As a consequence, Ljubljana reinforced its boundary with Croatia.